One job of our liver cells, and to a much smaller extent our kidney cells, is to actually regulate and maintain the proper glucose levels inside our blood. Now, why is that actually important? Why is it important to maintain the proper glucose levels? Well, because the cells of our body actually use that glucose to form the energy ATP molecules, and the ATP molecules are then used to power many different types of processes, such as, for instance, gluconeogenesis. So remember, gluconeogenesis actually uses up a net amount of ATP and GTP molecules. Now, liver cells and kidney cells can undergo gluconeogenesis, and they do actually undergo gluconeogenesis to a very large extent compared to other cells, because other cells, such as brain cells and muscle cells, don't actually use gluconeogenesis. They only use it to a very small extent under very extreme conditions. And in fact, we have cells of our body, such as red blood cells, that cannot use gluconeogenesis at all. And that's because red blood cells actually don't have mitochondria. And so red blood cells actually depend entirely on the glucose found inside the blood plasma, as do the brain cells and muscle cells of our body. So all these different types of cells actually get that glucose from the blood uptake that glucose and then use the glucose, break it down in glycolysis to form the ATP. And that's why it's so important that our liver cells and kidney cells can actually properly regulate the levels of glucose in our blood. Now, previously we saw how the energy charge value within the cell, the ratio of ATP to AMP, can actually be used to regulate the process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. So we can use the energy charge of the cell to basically tell us if glycolysis or gluconeogenesis actually predominates. Now, although that's true for liver cells and for kidney cells, because they regulate and maintain glucose levels, they also can use the glucose levels in the blood to basically determine whether glycolysis or gluconeogenesis actually predominates. So, on top of using the energy charge value to help us determine which process predominates, the glucose levels in our blood can also be used to actually tell us which one of these two processes actually predominates, glycolysis or gluconeogenesis. Now, the key element in this regulatory pathway, which is once again a reciprocal regulatory pathway, and we'll see what that means in just a moment, the key element in this pathway is a bifunctional allosteric enzyme that contains two different types of domains. Now, bifunctional simply means it has two different functions. In fact, the functions are essentially opposite functions, and that's why we call it reciprocal. Now, allosteric means it contains special sites that can bind allosteric effector molecules that can basically affect the activity of that protein. So this is our bifunctional allosteric enzyme, and we have two different domains. This domain is known as the phosphofructokinase 2 domain, PFK2. And this domain is known as the fructose bisphosphatase 2 domain, so FBPase 2. Now, because this ends in a kinase, you might expect that its function is to basically attach a phosphoryl group onto some type of molecule. And that's exactly right, as we'll see in just a moment. And likewise, because this molecule is known as a phosphatase, you might imagine that its function is to actually remove a phosphoryl group from a molecule. And that is exactly right. Their functionality is exactly opposite. So this bifunctional enzyme can exist in two states. So state A or state B. In state A, the phosphofructokinase 2, this structure is active while this one is inactive. And the reason it's active is because this serine residue found on this region here is not actually phosphorylated. Now, if protein kinase A takes an ATP and phosphorylates that serine residue on this domain, we create state B. And in state B, this becomes inactive while the other one becomes active. 
Now we can go back to this state by the action of phosphoprotein phosphatase, which uses a water molecule to hydrolyze that ester bond and remove that inorganic phosphate reforming state A. So we can basically cycle between state A and state B. So let's begin by looking at state A. So in the unphosphorylated state, the PFK2 domain, this one is active while this one is inactive. And we said that when this one is active, its function is to phosphorylate some type of molecule. Now, what molecule? Well, basically an intermediate in the process of glycolysis and also an intermediate in the process of gluconeogenesis. So fructose 6-phosphate. And this phosphorylates fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And we actually spoke about fructose 2,6-bisphosphate in the previous lecture. So we saw that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate is actually an allosteric effector molecule that affects the activity of enzymes in glycolysis as well as gluconeogenesis. So if you don't remember what this does, go back to the previous lecture and check that out. So and notice this one is inactivated in state A. Now, when we go to state B, when protein kinase A phosphorylates the serum residue to form this phosphorylated state, we see that that deactivates this molecule, the PFK2, while activating that fructose bisphosphatase 2. And what the fructose bisphosphatase 2 does is it basically reverses what this phosphofructokinase 2 actually does. And that's why we say they have a reciprocal function. They're opposite in what they actually do. So now what happens is the FBPase 2, because it's active, it causes the dephosphorylation. It removes that phosphoryl group from that fructose 2 bisphosphatase uh, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to form that fructose 6-phosphate. So now that we know what this key element is, the fact that we have this bifunctional allosteric enzyme found in the liver and kidney cells that basically is used to regulate this process of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, let's actually see how this all takes place. And essentially, we want to basically compare two different conditions. One condition is when we have high blood glucose levels. The other condition is when we have low blood glucose levels. And so let's suppose, let's begin with the high blood glucose levels. So let's suppose we just ate a meal that is rich in carbohydrates. And so we break down the carbohydrates into the individual glucose molecules. And that means the concentration of glucose in the blood essentially rises. And as it rises, that signals the release of insulin hormone molecules. And insulin basically goes on and creates some type of signal cascade that essentially ultimately activates a molecule known as phosphoprotein phosphatase. And this is the same molecule that we basically discussed here. Remember the phosphoprotein phosphatase is the enzyme that catalyzes the transformation of the bifunctional enzyme from B state to the A state. And so this basically stimulates this phosphoprotein phosphatase to activate the PFK2 domain. And once the PFK2 domain is activated, what it does is it goes on to activate the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And again, remember, fructose 6-phosphate is the third intermediate or the second intermediate in the process of glycolysis. So remember, in glycolysis, we first take glucose and transform it into um, a glucose 6-phosphate and then we transform glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. And fructose 6-phosphate can either transform into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to continue the process of glycolysis, but when this bifunctional enzyme is in this active state, it goes on to basically transform the fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And what this molecule does is, is it basically creates a positive feedback loop. So this molecule, fructose 2,6-bisphosphate acts 
as an allosteric effector, more specifically as a very potent allosteric activator of phosphofructokinase. And, and phosphofructokinase is needed to actually transform the fructose 6-phosphate into the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate that basically commits that fructose molecule, the glucose, to carrying out the process of glycolysis and that ultimately stimulates the process of glycolysis. At the same time that fructose 2,6-bisphosphate act, um, acts as an allosteric activator to phosphofructokinase, this same molecule will act as an allosteric inhibitor to, molecule, to an enzyme found in the process of gluconeogenesis. So when this pathway is followed, when we have high blood glucose levels, we see that glycolysis is essentially activated, but gluconeogenesis is essentially inhibited. Now, why does that actually make sense? Well, if we have high levels of glucose in our blood, our kidney cells and liver cells want to actually remove the excess glucose from our blood because high levels of glucose can actually be very toxic. And so what that means is these liver cells want to pull in these glucose molecules and then break down the glucose molecules to ATP molecules because that will also ultimately help us decrease the level of glucose in our blood. Now, what about the other case? What about if we have low blood glucose level? For example, let's say we're fasting. So if we fast, we essentially don't eat for an extended period of time. And we actually all fast when we sleep. So essentially, as we're sleeping, we essentially have a decrease in the glucose level in our blood. So if we fast, the same exact thing actually happens. And, we, and when we have a low blood glucose level, that stimulates a different type of uh, hormone known as glucagon. And glucagon also creates some type of signal transduction pathway. More specifically, it creates a cyclic AMP signal transduction pathway. And this secondary messenger molecule goes on to activate PKA, protein kinase A. And as we know from this particular discussion, protein kinase A transforms this state into this state. It phosphorylates that serine residue that inactivates the PFK2 and it activates that fructose bisphosphatase 2. And so now what happens is in the presence of low, uh, in, 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 in the presence of low blood glucose, in our blood plasma, the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate molecule that we formed here basically is transformed back into fructose 6-phosphate via the hydrolysis of that ester bond. And when this process takes place, this potent activator of phosphofructokinase can no longer activate that phosphofruct uh, that phosphofructokinase. And because this concentration decreases, it can no longer inhibit the enzymes of gluconeogenesis. And so this basically means gluconeogenesis will essentially be activated while glycolysis will basically decrease in the rate at which it actually takes place. Now, why does, why does that actually make sense? Well, if we have low blood glucose levels, what that means is we essentially want to create more glucose molecules. Why? Well, because the cells of our body, such as red blood cells, our brain cells, our skeleton muscle cells, our cardiac muscle cells, and so forth, all these different types of cells depend on glucose that is present in the blood. And if the levels of the glucose drops, that can be very dangerous to those cells because for instance, if our red blood cells cannot actually get the glucose from the blood because of the low levels of glucose in the blood, that can essentially lead to many, many different types of problems. And so what happens is the liver cells essentially begin to produce these glucose molecules from non-carbohydrate molecules such as pyruvate and lactate and amino acid and glycerol molecules. 
And once we produce those glucose molecules, the cells, the liver cells can release the glucose molecules into the blood and that will essentially maintain the proper glucose level in the blood. So this is basically the pathway that the liver cells and the kidney cells actually use to regulate and maintain the glucose levels in our blood. Now, one more thing I'd like to mention about insulin and glucagon is that these two different types of hormones also actually activate and inhibit certain types of gene expression. So insulin and glucagon also affect the rate at which our cells actually undergo gene expression and transcription. Now, in the case of insulin, because what insulin does is it ultimately wants to actually decrease the level of glucose in the blood it essentially begins to or it helps express those enzymes involved in uptaking the glucose from the blood and actually using that glucose to break it down for uh, uh, to break it down in glycolysis and so the enzymes of glycolysis basically will increase in the rate at which they're going to be uh, they're going to be produced and also glucose transporters such as glut4 will also express